The following stories tell the tale of three once amazing and talented athletes that ended up becoming cold-blooded killers. We have an NFL player who could have had everything, but just couldn't stay away from a life of crime famous skater whose heartbreak caused him to do the unthinkable, and a pro football player whose brain damage likely caused the death of six people. It was a horrifying crime. Members of a doctor's family shot and killed in their home by a former NFL player. Now, an autopsy has determined he had an unusually severe case of brain damage he suffered from his days on the field. Philip was born on July 20th of 1988 in South Carolina. Growing up, he loved sports, especially football and basketball, and he was very good at both. He played football in college for South Carolina State University and was rated sixth on the team, but that was only the beginning for him. In 2010, he was drafted by the San Francisco 49ers, but during a game against the St. Louis Rams, he suffered a badly broken ankle that required surgery to be repaired. He was dropped by the team the following year, but picked up by the New England Patriots. He would be dropped and picked up again by the Seattle Seahawks, before being dropped and picked up again once more, this time by the Oakland Raiders. It was with this team that Phillip really seemed to shine, but he also frequently got injured and suffered two concussions over the course of only three games. These concussions would begin to take a major toll on him and his mental stability. They were also beginning to affect his own ability to put his best foot forward in the game. The last team he played for was the Atlanta Falcons in 2015, but he did not return to the NFL after that. He was invited to come to a training camp with the Indianapolis Colts, but ended up missing his flight. Those around him knew that his head was not right, but nobody could have anticipated what was coming next. What's going on on Marshall Road? I think there's been a bad on April 7, 2021, he entered a neighbor's home at Rock Hill, South Carolina. For seemingly no reason at all, he shot six people. They all died. It was a shocking crime. A former NFL player who shot and killed six people before turning the gun on himself. The victims were Dr. Robert Leslie, his wife Barbara, and two of their grandchildren. Also, two air conditioner repairmen who happened to be at the doctor's home in South Carolina. The next day, police came to Phillip's home to apprehend him, but he refused to come out. This resulted in a dramatic standoff, with police communicating by using a loudspeaker to try to convince him to come out of the house. They even used a robot to try to persuade him to put down his gun and turn himself over. Before police could get to him, he sh and killed himself. His mother was in the home at the time, but police were able to get her out safely before her son took his own life. Police found no motive for the attack. The only connection seemed to be that the 32-year-old Philip Adams lived in the neighborhood. It's hard to make sense of a situation like this because nobody knows why. Why did someone with no criminal record just decide to go out and start killing people for no reason at all? It is believed that the brain damage sustained from all those concussions is what caused Philip to snap and that he was not in the right state of mind at the time of the shooting. Now researchers at Boston University who were asked to study Adam's brain say he was suffering from the debilitating brain disease, CTE. Adams had unusually severe frontal lobe damage from being hit in the head over and over during his sixth season football career. Police interviewed Philip's father shortly after the shooting occurred. The case is especially emotional and complicated for him because not only was the shooter his son, but he knew the doctor and his family. In fact, Dr. Leslie was his own former doctor. I don't think he ever did anybody any harm. He used to be my doctor, doctor, a long time ago. Uh, and I know there were good folks down there. I don't know what happened. And I, I, uh, we're going to keep him in our prayer. Philip's father says that his son was a good person, but that football ultimately played a major role behind his demise. He's a good kid. He was a good kid, and he, uh, I think the football messed him up. This has been a highly talked about case that raises a major discussion about football players and the effect of concussions on their mental health. If Philip had gotten treatment, or if he never got those concussions in the first place, would this have ever even happened? Professionals think maybe not. Now to the story that is sending waves of astonishment through the sports world. The one-time star tight end for the New England Patriots, Aaron Hernandez, was found dead 
in his prison cell this morning. This is a young man who went from having it all to going through a complete and utter downfall in only a matter of time. In just seven years, Hernandez plummeted from the penthouse to the jailhouse. Aaron Hernandez was born in Connecticut in 1989. His life was anything but easy. His father was very abusive and he and his brother lived in constant fear of him, but also greatly revered him. Aaron was great at sports, especially football and basketball. His father his father expected the best from him, and on one occasion, his father and high school football coach got into a physical altercation over coaching methods. It would be times like this that Aaron would show up for football practice with a black eye he received at home. His coach suspected that his father was behind the injury. When Aaron was just 16 years old, his father died due to complications from a hernia surgery. His mother, whom he became estranged from, would say that Aaron never got over his father's death and used it as an excuse to turn against all authority figures. Despite his very difficult past, Aaron would find success in the future through football. He was very popular and known for his great talent. When he was a senior, he was Gatorade's Football Player of the Year, and everyone was waiting to find out what he would do next. It was clear that he had a bright career ahead of him. He chose to tattoo his dad's advice on his arm. It's a quote my father always used to give me, if it is to be, it is up to me. Basically saying, whatever I want my life to be, it's, a, it's up to me to make it out that way. Initially, Aaron had planned to play football at the University of Connecticut alongside his brother, but at the last minute he ended up changing his mind and decided to play for the University of Florida instead. Coach Urban Meyer was influential in this decision. Coach Meyer had actually even convinced Aaron's high school principal to allow him to graduate early so that he could join the team as soon as possible. It worked and Aaron was not even 17 years old when he moved to Florida to play for the Gators alongside the likes of greats like Tim Tebow. Despite his obvious talents, Aaron was unpredictable. He would later reveal that he was constantly misusing substances, even when he was on the field. Tebow reportedly was trying to guide him in the right direction, but found it difficult. Things took a turn in 2009, when Aaron decided to celebrate a touchdown during a game by throwing the football out into the stands. Because this action risked getting a foul penalty, onlookers viewed Aaron as someone who was confident and who had nothing to lose. But unfortunately, Aaron's substance misuse was getting out of control and his coach and teammates knew it. He was informed that he was not going to be welcomed back onto the team for his fourth and final year. His only option now was to join the draft and hope that a team would pick him. Some teams were reluctant to pick him because they knew of his past, but the New England Patriots decided to take a chance on him and drafted him in 2010, just one day after they drafted the now infamous Rob Gronkowski. Aaron was signed to a four-year conference with the team for a whopping 2.37 million. In the next several years that followed, he would show off his incredible athletic talent and even appear in the Super Bowl. Unfortunately, Aaron would not stay on the straight and narrow path to victory. Despite seemingly having everything, he took part in a life of crime that would ultimately result in his downfall. This would lead to one of the most highly talked about criminal trials of all time. Aaron was accused of murder that took place in the center of what can be referred to as New England Patriots country. The day was June 15th of 2013, and it was the day that Mike Branch, the coach of the semi-pro league that the Boston Bandits would never forget. It was out on the field that Saturday morning with his team when something felt wrong. A black suburban pulls like right up on my car. I'm like, who's pulling right in front of my car? Inside the car is 27-year-old Odin Lloyd, a friend of Mike's. Mike considers this to be rather odd because he knows Odin doesn't have a car of his own. But he never got a chance to inquire further about who the vehicle belonged to because Odin was too excited talking about the night before. He said he had gone out to the club with Aaron Hernandez and that they had spent a ton of money, $10,000 to be exact. Those that were close to Odin were surprised to hear of his wild night because they knew a much different side to him. And it wasn't a partier side. He was someone who was passionate about football. Whistle blows, he's coming full throttle. And family. Oh, we definitely always took care of moms and sisters. My brother and I were kind of like, uh, I wouldn't say best friends, but you know, as close as siblings can get. Mike Branch had coached Odin back when he was in high school and would frequently give him advice, even into adulthood. At some point, we realized we're not going to the NFL. This is just gonna be for fun. 
what I got to do is stop preparing myself a lot. Odin's career in football hadn't worked out the way he had hoped it would, but he wasn't going to let life get him down. He was working in landscaping while he tried to figure out what would be next for him. There was an interesting link between Odin and Aaron. Odin was dating a girl named Shania Jenkins, and Shania happened to be the little sister of Shayana Jenkins, Aaron's long-term girlfriend, who would eventually become his fiance and the mother of his child. Aaron and Odin were friends, but they lived very different lives. Aaron had made it in the NFL while Odin was left to figure out what his life path was meant to be. Odin and his friends spent June 16th of 2013 having lots of fun, cruising in the car and playing pool. But then he got a text message from another friend asking to hang out and party again. He agreed to go, despite needing to be at work early the next day. One of the friends he was with told him he'd see him later. Little did he know. There would be no later. The next night, Monday, June 17th, 5.37 p.m., Lloyd's body is discovered by a jogger in North Attleboro, 35 miles south of where he lives. Odin was found with his wallet and driver's license. He had been shot in the back. His close friend Daryl vividly recalled when Odin's sister called him hysterically and told him that her brother was dead. I got to the house, I got inside, like... And you saw his mom? Dad. What did she say? Daryl, who killed my son? What do you say to that? All Daryl could tell her was the truth. He did not know. Odin's friends had a lot of questions, but the biggest one was, who was Odin with that night? His little sister had the answer. She had seen her big brother get picked up that night, but at the time she hadn't known by whom. It wasn't until he strangely texted her later on to verify that she was aware of who he was with. His text to her was simple. He said only NFL. It wasn't until later on that it was determined that Aaron Hernandez was one of the people Odin was with that night. But did that mean that he was actually responsible for his death? That was what would have to be determined during the trial. After a jogger finds Odin Lloyd's bullet riddled body, police quickly find their first pieces of evidence. Distinctive tire tracks, Lloyd's cell phone, and keys for that black Suburban he'd been driving all weekend. Records show that the black Suburban had been leased by Aaron Hernandez. Police search Aaron's vehicles and home, and just days later, he is arrested. The charges, first degree premeditated murder and having illegal weapons. His plea? No, do it. And he's no longer a New England Patriot. Bill Belichick, coach of the New England Patriots, came forward to make a statement about where they stood with Aaron. I and other members of the organization were shocked and disappointed. Aaron made multiple attempts to make bail, but was denied. It would come out in court that Aaron was looking for backup the night of the alleged murder occurred. He called up two friends with prior criminal records and asked them to come by that night. He was also in communication with Odin through text messages on and off that night. Upon looking at surveillance footage, when these two friends arrived at Aaron's home that night, the NFL player was holding what appeared to be a gun. The group then took off in the early mornings of the day. The three of them departed uh, the defendant's home at 1.12 in the morning in the silver Nissan Altima. The group stops at the gas station before heading on to Odin's house where they pick him up. It becomes clear that tensions are thick. Aaron is mad at Odin because of who he spoke with at the club the night before. He was worried that he couldn't trust him. It's not long after the gunshots are heard at what is later determined to be the murder scene and the car that carried Aaron and his friends returns to the Hernandez home, but without Odin. Home surveillance once again showed Aaron holding a gun. The next day, Aaron and his friends returned the Nissan Altima to the rental place they got it from, a gun casing still inside. It would be determined that the casing was the same one from the gun that murdered Odin. But that's not all. Tire marks at the scene of the crime matched the vehicle Aaron and his friends had been driving that day. As Aaron Hernandez adjusts to life behind bars, charged with murder, yet another accusation of gun violence makes headlines. Four months before Odin Lloyd is gunned down. On the night that Aaron had spent close to $10,000 at a club, he had been with another man named Alexander Bradley. That same night, an altercation occurred and it ended with Alexander being shot in the face and dumped out of a vehicle left for dead. While he survived, he did lose an eye. It wasn't until months after the incident that he filed a lawsuit against Aaron, saying that he was the reason that he lost his eye. Bradley later tells prosecutors he was 
hot after Hernandez felt disrespected during an argument over a missing cell phone. It would come out through court proceedings that Aaron and his crew were regularly misusing substances and that he would pay Odin to get these substances. But that's not all. One of the substances that Aaron was misusing is known to make you paranoid. This could explain why Aaron always seemed to think everyone was out to get him. Meanwhile, as Aaron prepared to go to trial in 2013, some were surprised by how well he had adjusted to prison life. He was reportedly calm and spent a lot of time reading his Bible. When the trial began, he pleaded not guilty to Odin's murder. A bar manager came forward who claimed she did see Odin and Aaron together on the night of the murder. Mr. Hernandez and the other gentlemen were smoking on the corner of the street. When you say they were smoking, what were they smoking? I believe marijuana, because that's where the smell was coming from. The defense would also present video evidence of Aaron and the rest of his crew at the gas station shortly before the murder was believed to have taken place. They also had surveillance of him buying blue bubblicious gum, the same gum that would later be found at the crime scene. Not only that, but he also appeared to be wearing a white towel around his neck, which would also be found at the crime scene. The trial got very intense and emotional at times. One of these times was when Aaron's fiance brought their four-year-old daughter, Avil, to court. The little girl looked confused and distressed. Her father's face lit up when he saw her and he blew her a kiss. When prosecutors showed jurors pictures of the victim's body found just half a mile from Hernandez's home, the dead man's mother rushed from the courtroom in tears. Clearly, the prosecution had a lot of evidence against Aaron, and it wasn't looking very good for him. At this point, he was facing not only a murder charge, but charges for gun-related offense as well. If he was convicted for murder, he would likely be spending the rest of his life behind bars. But it would be up to the jury to decide whether or not he was guilty. All waited in anticipation for the verdict to be read. What say you, Madam Four Person? Is the defendant not guilty, guilty of murder in the first degree, or guilty of murder in the second degree? Guilty of murder in the first degree. Hernandez found guilty on three counts, first degree murder and two weapons charges. Aaron's mother and fiance could be seen crying and comforting each other as the verdict was read. Meanwhile, Odin's mother came forward to reveal that she had forgiven Aaron and anyone else that played a role in her son's murder. I forgive the hands of the people that had a hand in my son's murder, either before or after. And I pray and hope that someday Everyone out there will forgive them also. The motive behind why Aaron did what he did to Odin is not fully known. However, some have speculated that Aaron was bisexual and believed that Odin was going to leak this information. Aaron would ultimately be sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. But it was not a long life behind bars by any means. Former NFL star Aaron Hernandez found dead in his prison cell overnight. Apparently, he killed himself. Aaron hung himself in his prison cell using his bed sheets. He was rushed to the hospital, but it was too late. He was dead. He had been smoking a drug known to induce psychosis prior to his death. His Bible was open to the passage John 3.16, and John 3.16 was also written on his forehead. The passage reads, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Inside his prison cell, the police found that he had dumped shampoo on the floor and wedged cardboard in the door, likely in an attempt to make it harder for someone to get in. He also made strange symbols on the walls in blood, including one associated with the Illuminati. He also left a note for his fiance in which he told her how much he loved her as well as one for his daughter. He did not seem to be fully with it when writing the letters. He was just 27 years old at the time of his death. In an interview following Aaron's death, his former fiance, Shayana, was asked what she thought about the letters. Does this strike you as a man who's um, sort of at peace with the decision he's about to make or in real distress? It strikes me as not normal. So um, something was affecting him at that time. Aaron's young daughter is now 10 years old. She has a younger sister named Giselle. Even after everything, Shayana appears to still be standing by Aaron. In 2021, she shared a picture of him holding a pair of their daughter's shoes and wrote this tribute. Since you've been gone, the loss hasn't gotten any easier. I still hurt, I still cry, I still wonder why. Your memory is what gets me through each day as I remember all the special things about you. 
unknown, you are missed, loved, and thought of heavily today. Aviel and I continue to talk about you and keep your presence alive. May you continue to rest in peace and watch over us daily with love always and forever. If you thought this story was crazy, wait until you hear about this next one. A former professional skateboarder and now convicted killer may be on his way to being a free man after spending more than 30 years in prison. But tonight, CBS 8 Steve Fiorina tells us the victim's family and friends are hoping a parole recommendation is once again rejected by the governor. This is another story of someone who had everything but chose to just throw it all away. Mark Raukowski was born on August 10th of 1966 in New York. His parents divorced when he was young and he ended up moving to California. He was a very athletic child who enjoyed Little League Baseball and skateboarding. He was just 10 years old when he was picked up by a local skate team. And by the age of 14, he was already starting a career in skateboarding in 1982. Mark, who became better known as Gator, was very successful at first. He was winning contests and getting featured on magazine covers. He also had deals with skateboard clothing and equipment companies, which was bringing him in boatloads of cash. He was being compared to other great skaters like Tony Hawk, Steve Caballero, and Lance Mountain, just to name a few. It wasn't just his professional life that was booming, but his personal life as well. In 1987, he met two ladies by the names of Brandy McLean and Jessica Bergsten, who would play important roles in his life. He began dating Brandy and the two started showing up alongside one another in different promotion and advertisements for Vision, a popular skating brand at the time. It seemed as if Mark was at the top of his world with everything going for him. But by the time the 1990s came around, the trends around skateboarding were changing. The type of skating Mark was known for was out and street skating was in. As a result, Mark's popularity began to drop. Before long, he was forced to file for bankruptcy. But trouble for Mark didn't end there. While visiting Germany, he had a bad accident, which involved him falling out of a window. He returned to California to recover from his injuries and spent time with a man named Augie Costantino. Augie was an ex-surfer and a born-again Christian, and he had a major influence upon Mark. In fact, he played a big role in Mark's decision to convert and become a strict Christian evangelist. The only problem was that due to his new religion, he would not be able to continue having relations with Brandy since they were not married. So he suggested that they go ahead and tie the knot. But Brandy wasn't ready and Mark's huge life change was too much for her. Not only that, but Mark was becoming an increasingly jealous person and he was also violent at times, even going as far as to lock her in a closet. So she eventually broke up with him and returned home to stay with her parents. Mark basically lost it when Brandy left and wouldn't accept the breakup. He would go to her house and try to steal back gifts he gave to her. He would threaten both her and her new boyfriend when she began dating again. Brandy told the police about what was going on, but little was done about the situation. She was very afraid of Mark and thought he might try to kill her. On March 20th of 1991, Mark reached out to Brandy's friend, Jessica Bergsten, whom he had met earlier on. She was 22 years old at the time and had just moved to the city. He offered to show her around San Diego. The two met up on March 21st and spent the day together. They then headed back to his condo to drink, relax, and watch movies. While there, Mark completely lost it. He later said Jessica reminded him too much of his ex, Brandy. He came up behind her and hit her over the head with a club until she was partially unconscious. He then shackled her to his bed and took advantage of her. When he was finally done with her, he covered up her mouth to keep her from breathing. And when she was dead, he threw her into his surfboard bag. He drove her body to the desert where he left it in a shallow grave. She was reported missing by her father a week later after nobody was able to get in touch with her. The next month, on April 10th of 1991, some campers were out in the desert and they discovered Jessica's body and reported it to the authorities. It was so badly decomposed by that point that they couldn't even identify it. Mark was consumed by guilt and ultimately confessed to his friend Augie what he had done. 
Augie urged him to go to the police and turn himself in, which he did the following day. Mark told the police everything he did to poor Jessica and was able to show them where he left her body. It was a case that totally shocked the nation and made major headlines. Mark was charged with first degree murder. He was analyzed by a psychologist and it was determined that he was suffering from bipolar disorder and manic depression. He claimed that he knew Jessica didn't deserve to die, but that killing her was some sort of misdirected way to get back at his ex. Mark pleaded guilty to the charges and he was sentenced to a total of 31 years to life behind bars. He was just 24 at the time. This year of 2023, Mark was almost a free man after being granted parole, but then the governor of California stepped in. Well, that's right. After Mark Rogowski was granted parole last year for a second time, Governor Newsom once again reversed the state parole board's decision to release him. His lawyer believes that Mark has done his time and deserves to be a free man. He's just a peace-loving man. He really is. When I realized that that's, that feels like cognitive dissonance when you contrast that with the horrificness of his crime. In a rare 2016 interview, Mark discussed how he now prides himself on his ability to take responsibility for his actions. So I'm taking responsibility for today. I own today. Yeah, it's great. Dealing with loss, you know, you lose somebody, you lose something. Our tendency is to blame other people. Mark also said that he thought he had a lot of problems that were tied to growing up in a single family home and feeling as if he had to constantly impress his mother in order to gain her approval. He is now 56 years old. It's not clear if he will ever be a free man again. Do you believe that Mark deserves to spend the rest of his life behind bars? Or do you think he learned his lesson? Let us know in the comments. So there we have it. Three very sad and unfortunate cases of famous athletes that had it all, but lost everything through their own actions. It's hard to imagine going from living the kind of life that many people dream of to experiencing a complete and utter downfall. Thanks for watching and sleep tight.